Hi, welcome to Community Conversations. I'm Rosie Agudo. I'm from Meriden Wallingford Chrysalis. And here with me is Marcia Roman from Women and Family Center. Uh, today we would like to discuss home violence, uh, sexual assault, and domestic violence. And I wanted to talk to my friend Rosie here about our services and all the things that we've gone through in all these years that we've been working together. The importance of, I feel, the job that we do is, for me, it's been a very rewarding, uh, even though a lot of the stories are sad or, you know, they're traumatic, but it's been rewarding because I've learned a lot for myself. I don't know about you, but I learned a lot about myself in the sense of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, um, how to take care of myself which I think is so important, especially for women, because mm -hmm. a lot of times I think we're doing a lot of other things, the home, being a mother, being a wife, you know, so you become all involved with all of those type of things. And you t tend to forget about who you are and how to take care of yourself. Um, and sometimes what happens with all of that is um, there's a lot of violence in the home, and a lot of times women keep it to themselves. They don't, they have a hard time going out and talking about it. So that's the reason why I think both of us yeah. are here. In, in the years past, I know with sexual assault and domestic violence, it was skeletons in the closet. You were told not to speak about it. You know, as a woman, you know, when you're married or you're with a partner, a domestic partner, it was as if you had to cater mm -hmm. to your partner and sometimes I know it was like all right if something is going on what is going on what happened in other words like kind of blaming the wife or the girlfriend of what did you do well really they didn't do anything well with in my case I find that um, the mother especially, she tends to, she blames herself if a child, because there's cases every day of uh, children getting molested and there's perpetrators out there and sometimes, and the craziest part about it is that it's not usually strangers. It's family members or very close friends. So they feel guilty because they feel like they allowed it or that how could they not see this? How could they not recognize it? And perpetrators are so, they exactly know what they're doing. They get very close. Usually they get close to women that have, you know, children, and they're alone, and they're needy. And they just, you know, they become very friendly, very nice. They'll do anything they want. It's what they, they expect, like what the woman is expecting in a relationship. Right. That pretty much it goes hand in hand with domestic violence when when a woman is a lot of times like the perpetrator is looking at a woman who is at a weak point in her life mm -hmm. who is alone who sometimes do have children but they're at a weak point in their life so they come in fitting this description of what they're looking for here's a man that can help me or a woman because mm -hmm. The victim, this victim could be female or male. Correct. You know, at that point, they're at a weak, weak point in their life, and this is a person that they're looking for. This is, you know, it's like a dream. Like, wow, I can't believe this is happening to me. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it takes a while for, th for them to rec recognize what's going on. And when they do recognize what's going on, it's they're basically... And so deep, they don't know what to do, who they can reach out to. And that's where basically we come in, like what we do. That's, right. you know, we give that support to these men and women. The other thing is, um, you know, sexual assault and domestic violence are so connected. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, 
there's a lot of times that women that are married or they have a partner that they're living with, they can be assaulted and don't even recognize that they're being assaulted because they feel, well, because he's my partner, he's not going to hurt me, or they want to deny when they do get assaulted in the home. And that's the hardest part, I think, because knowing that person is with you day in and day out. Um, so it's kind of hard, you know, for them to come out and say, this happened to me. Um, and I find that happens a lot, especially with women. Some women don't even recognize it, you know, and um, only when if it's happened to their child or then, you know, men. Men usually don't come out and say, well, my my wife is being abusive or something happened or I'm being sexually assaulted by this woman because it can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes men don't want to come out and say what happened to them. One out of four girl gets molested before 18 and boys is one to six mm -hmm. before their age of 18. So that, that's a very high number. We're trying to work more on that part so we can get connected with men because we do know that they're out there. I could remember what first time I worked with a male mm -hmm. survivor. You know, I we always have our initial visit and when I was talking to him it was as if, if he was afraid to talk about what happened because there's this stigma that a male should be macho, mm -hmm. you know, a man cannot be a victim of domestic violence. They can not go through that violence, either it being the different forms of it. And that's one other thing. A lot of people think, when you think domestic violence, oh, it's hitting, mm -hmm. it's choking, it's physical. The thing is, it's, it's not only physical. Right. It's financially abusive. It's emotionally verbally and mentally abusive there's so many forms of abuse that he sat there and he, it was as if he was afraid but as we spoke I could see him coming out more in other words like trusting me more and I was seeing him for a couple of months and by the time the last time I saw him it was like a totally different person you know, here was a man that was broken the first time I met him. He didn't know what choices he had. And by the time that the last time I saw him, he was able to advocate for himself. He knew what he needed to do. And it was so rewarding seeing that, just wow. being able to support somebody like that. I know I had a, a male client, and he was very, very angry. And we had to work on that anger first to be able to get him to the point where he can kind of open up and have other feelings. Because usually there's anger, there's sadness, there's depression. Um, they have to go through all these feelings before you can really get to the point of, okay, you know, now you're feeling better and you can open your mind to getting the healing. The stages, there's different mm -hmm. stages of so. healing. And it was, you know, it was kind of difficult for him, and I could tell. And as you were saying, for him to open up and trust, you know, even though it wasn't done by a woman, but he had a hard time talking to a woman about what had happened to him. And I was glad that he continued coming for a little while, and then, you know, I guess he felt much better, and he just didn't come any longer. But. And, you know, just to be brave, to be able to come in and say this happened to me because it's hard for them. Even for women, it's hard for them to come and say this happened to me. Sometimes they feel guilty or they feel ashamed. Um, they feel like they're the ones that did something wrong, either because of the way they dressed or maybe I should have listened to my mom if they're young and they were now partying and it happened at a party. They feel like they have the guilt of what happened to them because they didn't listen to their mom or they didn't listen to their friends. It's um, also like in domestic violence, you know, we have a, a domestic violence shelter and this is a place where women or men 
or families are able to stay when things really get tough, that there is no other place or anything else for them to do. And when they come in, it's you can hear in their voice that they're ashamed. They feel guilty. What could I have done differently that this would not have happened? Not knowing that they could have done things so much differently and it would have still happened. And not knowing that it's all about power and control. Though that right there is the two main things, it's power and control. You can be the perfect person in front of somebody and they will still argue with you, blame you for things because it's all about power and control. For me, the hardest part, I think, is um, when a child gets molested and the parents want, they want it right now. You know, we want, we want to get revenge or we want the police to do something, the court to do something. And all those cases, they take so long. You know, every case is different. And that's where sometimes parents don't understand. I had a mom that she used to get really bent out of shape every week. She would come every week to see me, but she'd be in the, poof, she'd be so angry about everything. And he's not doing this, the detective's not doing that. Um, you know, they're not listening to me, and she wanted to call and call, and I kept trying to tell her, they're doing their work. You need to, you know, calm down a little bit because they have to make sure that they get all their T's and their I's dotted because once they take it to court, they want to make sure that they have all the evidence. So like this, when he gets in the court, there's no way for him to let him go. Otherwise, they're going to have to let him go, and that's going to be worse. So I have to explain sometimes those type of things to the parents that, you know, all these cases, they take a while. And I think it frustrates them, and it frustrates me sometimes. But I have to talk to them about it because they really can, you know, be calling every day. Did you hear this? Or did the police officer call? You know, I want to make sure that they have everything in order so we can get it going. Uh, but they, it does take a while. You know, I had a case uh, of a young lady that uh, was assaulted, and it took almost a year and a half, almost two years for them to finally catch him. And he went to court, you know, and they arrested him, which I was so glad that that happened because I thought that case was going to be lost in the middle of the way. But it didn't happen that way. They did arrest him and he was in jail. So, Do you do court accompaniment with clients just as what we do? Yes. I do court accompaniment. We also go to the police stations if in case, you know, they need to go do their statement. Um, and then on Wednesdays I go to advocacy, which is called up in Longworth. And we mm -hmm. go there and um, we support the parents while the child is being um, interviewed by a clinician. They're being interviewed by a clinician and we go into the room and we talk to the parents about the procedure, what's going on, you know, if they have any questions, sometimes they have questions, they worry about their child, you know, are they going to be okay. And those clinicians, they're so good over there and usually the child comes out fine. I think the parent is more upset than the child is mm -hmm. and they feel more relief because they finally told someone. And what they do there is they, they film it, and there's police officers, and there's uh, DCF, and everybody's together. And then they're in another room while the clinician's doing the interview. And then they, they copy it, they tape it, and they give it to the police officers. So if in case it needs to go to court, that has, they have all the evidence. And the child doesn't have to continue doing the interview with the police officers. They, they don't have to do the interview with DCF because mm -hmm. before that's how it used to be, just like adults. They have to go a million and one places to do the interviews. And it's a lot. Yeah. So I'm glad I, that they're doing that. I know with Chrysalis, we work so well together. Mm -hmm. If a client needs court accompaniment, you know, we have the Family Violence Victims Advocate that is based right there out of the court. He's there for arraignments and everything and he, he calls some of the victims and explains to them what's going on. We have our civil legal court advocate who does a lot of our referrals and does a lot of court accompaniment. 
I know sometimes just as a regular advocate, sometimes we are able to do court accompaniment with our clients and sometimes if, for instance, and it does happen, if that civil legal court advocate is busy, we're able to go to court with our clients, provide that support and just be that body there that is able to talk to them, let them know what to expect. One thing, a lot of the clients are afraid to show their emotions when they're mm -hmm. speaking to the judge. And I've always mentioned, you know, take your time. Mm -hmm. When you're being asked questions, just take your time. You know, if you have to pause, pause, and then just keep speaking. If a tear, or if you do get emotional, I always mention to them, it's not the end of the world. It just makes you look human. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't show any emotion, sometimes, you know, they wonder what's going on. And the emotions can be just, it can be a, f just, they can notice it on your face. It could be tears, anything. I remember one client, um, she was so afraid to go to court and I was there with her. Her perpetrator just, he intentionally just kept looking at her and glaring at her wow. to manipulate her to, you know, get nervous and mess up what she was going to say and she did fabulous. You know, she told the incident, everything that had happened, all the years of abuse, the things that she had to put up with. And she did show her emotions and you know, he tried to interrupt, and of course, when you're in court, the judge will, you know, will say something for them to quiet down. I remember the judge, um, she took a little break, and the marshal had everybody leave, and she had come up to us, and the marshal had mentioned to us, you can stay in the courtroom if you'd like. And what was so great was when that marshal looked at my client and said, you did great. I don't want you to think that you messed up. You did phenomenal. And for me, that was so reassuring. And I could see it and I could feel it from my client that she was actually relaxed at that point. And she knew she did what she wanted to do, what she set out to do in court. I, I had a case um, that I went to court with uh, one of my clients. And I'm glad that I did because she was so upset and angry that she was getting like kind of nasty and I had to tell her don't don't go there it's better that you just calm down and you know let them talk and then if you need to talk you go ahead and you say what you need to say don't you know come out with all this other stuff because it just they weren't even going to listen to her if she you know she acted out and probably what was going to happen she was going to end up getting thrown out so I told her to calm down and I was glad that I was there because she was able to just listen to what's going on and then you know, go for her case, because she had to come back two or three times, so it was getting to the point that she was just angry, she wanted to get it all done with. And then I had another case that she was Spanish speaking, very timid, she, she had come to see me and I said to her, we need to go talk to the advocate at the court. And we did, and I'm glad that we did, because all the information that we gave her, and she goes, okay, I'm going to get right on it, and you don't need to worry about it. And they ended up giving her a restraining order for the guy because he was harassing her. He was calling her on her phone. Even though she had put a block on his number, he was calling through another number mm -hmm. to harass her and bother her. So, And she had it on the phone, and she had some other guy call her to give her information about this guy. It was all harassment through someone else. So when I told the advocate at the court, she went and wrote everything else. She gave her the uh, restraining order, so they would leave. He would, the guy would leave her alone, because it was mainly the guy. And then when we got out of there, I was like, oh, I'm so glad that we went, and I'm glad that we did it right then and there, you know, because she came to see me, and from that point we went to the court right away to find out if something could get done, because she wasn't sleeping well, she couldn't even eat, you know, she had all these nerves. And she was so fearful of what he was going to do, you know, stuff like that. Because that's, those are some of the things that victims go through. They have nightmares in the middle of the night. They have hot flashes. Uh, they go through all these 
things that, you know, sometimes they can't sleep. So I always tell them, if you can't sleep at night and you feel the need, you need to call us. Please call the, you know, the number that, the hotline number that we have so they can call us and talk to someone. Because sometimes they do need to talk to someone. Yeah. It's yeah. like a roller coaster of emotions mm -hmm. with everything that they're going through. Yeah. I know at Chrysalis, our hotline that is 24-7, there is somebody there the whole time. And sometimes, you know, the calls that we get, I know on a typical day um, for me, you know, I come in in the morning, um, I'm on hotline from 8 in the morning till noon. The hotline calls range differently. Mm -hmm. It could be just somebody who has been referred to our services because there has been a history of domestic violence and um, they're being referred so they could understand the dynamics of dom domestic violence. It could be somebody who has been enduring domestic violence for years and finally they want to leave. They, they're ready to leave. They're ready to put their plan into action. And that's going into shelter that, you know, we do have a shelter that it's 60 day to a possibility of 90 days, a 90 day, 60 to a 90 day stay. And honestly, when somebody calls a hotline, that is the hardest thing they can do. A lot of times they think the hardest thing that they could do is when they when they come in for services, but just picking up that phone and calling the hotline and saying, I need help. How can you help me? That takes a lot of courage and strength, uh -huh. and they don't see it. As I said, we have women and men looking for shelter. We also have, I think this is our second year that we have the lethality assessment program that we are partnered up with, I believe right now it's Wallingford Police Department and Meriden Police Department, where if they go to a call that is a domestic, there is a questionnaire that they have to ask the clients. And some of them, if they answer yes, they'll call our hotline wow. and we'll speak to the client. Because these are calls that, you know, they can be, they're very dangerous. They're very high risk. Part of the prevention piece is while they're there answering a call is, and after they take their information, they'll call our hotline with the victim there. We'll speak to the victim. We'll tell them about our services. And a lot of times they'll come in for services or they're interested in shelter. So we're doing that piece this time. You know, she's getting services at the same time ahead of time by speaking to a counselor an advocate on the hotline so she knows her rights. She knows what, what her support systems are. Um, and a lot of times we'll go into the different things that we do. We tell them about the civil legal court advocate, that she's able to do referrals, help her with going to court, help her fill out for a restraining order, tell them that they will be expecting a call from the family violence victims advocate after he's arraigned or before the arraignment coming into shelter and that there will be their time there, there's somebody, an advocate that will be working with them with their basic needs and what they want to accomplish while they're there. Or if they only want individual services, outreach services, how they can go about that. And also group services. You know, we have a great group during the evenings on Tuesdays. The first time I started at the group, there was only like two women. Wow. And right now I have about five or six women. And they are a great bunch of women. They support each other so much what? that I'm so proud. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing these women in group. It's such a blessing to be there and being able to support anybody who calls just with the job that I do, just being able to support somebody who's going through something and giving them a minute or an hour of peace, mm -hmm. that puts a smile on my face. I feel accomplished. I know for us, you know, doing the group on Fridays in the morning, I really enjoy that. 
because not only we get to get together, but also to help women going through this horrible time um, for their healing process, which, mm -hmm. you know, we try to do. We talk. We talk about different topics, but at the same time, we also try to do some, you know, activities, which I think uh, it helps a lot, you know, the painting stuff or, you know, do some something, some type of craft, which I or think Or just like some of the handouts that we do. Mm -hmm. Just like some of the women when they're like, oh, I oh, this is what happens. Then when we point it out that that is domestic violence and mm -hmm. just you see the light bulb go off and it's like, yes, she gets it. <laughs> this is awesome. Honestly, this, this group on fri Friday during the mornings, it's phenomenal. You know, it's hard enough that to get women to come in and speak about the subject, it's having that dual group. They don't have to go to two different right. places. It's going to one place, and they get to talk about both things that they're going, that's going on in their lives. The other thing is they don't feel so alone, because a lot of times when you're going through things like this, you don't think that, you don't think anyone else is going through it, or that you're, it's all you, and you're going through so many emotions at the same time, and to find that someone else feels exactly like you feel. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a blessing. And it's also that support and not having, one thing I always hear is nobody understands me. Mm -hmm. Nobody in my family or none of my friends understand me. They ask me, oh, when are you gonna, when are you gonna be okay? How long is it gonna take you? And the thing is, is there's no time limit in healing. Everybody is different. Yeah. Um, and just knowing that they're talking to somebody that is there to support them and not judging them because sometimes they do get judged mm -hmm. by their family and their friends even if they don't even if their friends and family don't feel that they are or intentionally they're not doing it they are judging them mm -hmm. and just them going to a safe zone for them is you could see it on their face that they're just relieved to be somewhere that they can talk freely to other women who are going through what they're going through, have gone through what they they are currently going through, and that they have that support. Rosie, thank you for joining me in this community conversation, and I hope that people will call our hotline if they feel the need or something happens. I hope this conversation that we had and whoever does see it, it gives them the strength to pick up the phone mm -hmm. and reach out to us because we are there to support them and willing to help them. So I hope they do reach out. a man would let that happen to him. It's none of my business. He just needs to get over it. Why didn't he fight back? Why didn't he tell anyone? He seems just fine to me. Not at this school. Not on this team. Not in this family. We don't talk about that. While women and children represent the majority of victims of sexual and domestic violence, men are affected as well. Males are sexually and physically abused and assaulted. They are witnesses and bystanders to violence and sometimes they're the perpetrators. The statistics on the sexual abuse and assault of males are staggering. It is estimated that one in six men had an unwanted or abusive sexual experience in childhood. This figure, which many believe is conservative, represents nearly 19 million adult males in the United States. If you or someone you know has had an unwanted or abusive sexual experience, know that you are not alone and there is help. If you're the parent of a young child and want to know best how to keep your kids safe and talk to your kids about unwanted and inappropriate sexual contact, there are resources for you. If you're a man who wants to be a part of a growing movement that is working to promote healthy relationships and end violence against all people, men, women, and children, then we welcome you to join us.